Thank you so much, Carrie. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that all the world through him might be saved. He came to us. We'll just take a minute and look at you if I could have that luxury. It's good to see so many sinners in one place. <laughs> and if I had a mirror, I could hold it up here and see one more. Sinners saved by God's grace, by the most, for the most part, here saved by grace, but still sinners. Loved of God, sought of God, redeemed of Christ, and children of the King. It's wonderful. As I look around at this place, these grounds down at the college, this gorgeous auditorium. I see the handiwork of God and I see what God can do with those who walk with him and to whom he gives a heavenly vision and who in faith pursue that vision, doing impossible things with a God who does all things well and who knows no, no disability to do whatever pleases him. I thank God for this place, for your pastor, for the staff, for the young people here in the college. I see your faces, I hear your orchestra, I hear the choir. I thank God for the right kind of music. And I wonder if the Lord might not be giving us yet a reprieve in this nation. Some years ago, I was on an airplane flying from Atlanta to Detroit, a little kid next to me, about nine or ten, little chubby little boy. We struck up a nice conversation. He told me he had never seen a Bible, had no idea what it was. I had to explain to him what the Bible was. And of course, I presented the Lord to him, and it was just beyond his comprehension but some seed was sown. I hope I'll see that little boy in heaven. And uh, he told me he was going to have a two-week visit with his dad up in Detroit. It was a split home. And then he challenged me to a game of checkers, which I was foolish enough to take him up on. And he cleaned my clock. <laughs> I learned then, don't ever, don't ever accept a challenge from a little kid. He wouldn't challenge an adult if he didn't think he was very, very good. And then I said, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? He, oh, he said, I want to play in the NBA. I want to be a professional basketball player. I looked at this little guy. He was as wide as he was tall. And I, I just read the week before somewhere that at that time there were about 250 million people in America and about 250 players in the NBA. Well, I said, son, that's a noble ambition, I guess. Um, uh, perhaps uh, you'll do that someday, but I, I think you need to know something. Told me about 250 million in America, 250 in the NBA. I said, son, do you realize if a, if a million men stood in one big long line, only one could step out and play in the NBA? And he looked at me with the greatest look of indignation you've ever seen, and he said, well, yeah, mister, but I can still hope, can't I? I didn't mean to shatter his hope, but I look at this, all of you, these college students, this dynamic spirit-filled place, and I think, Lord, I can still hope, can't I? Maybe there would be revival still. Maybe you would come again and bless your people like you did in days of old. I don't know where we are on God's calendar, nor do you. But we should never discount what God can do. Amen. With him, all things are possible. We don't know what he will do, but we know what he can do, all things. 
And so we must pray. We must pray God's protection around this place. This is the Lord's doing, and it's wonderful in our eyes. It's also a prize in the devil's eyes. Wherever God's at work, Satan's at work, you know that. He doesn't build anything. He destroys everything he can destroy. The beautiful Garden of Eden was his first effort, and he's continued with great success because of our hearts of sinful rebellion, and he's had a lot of success subverting, destroying what God has done, corrupting the work of God and the people of God. This is the Lord's place. Don't let the devil in here, folks. Pray a wall of protection around this place, around your pastor, your leadership here. I do thank the Lord for the times pastor has preached at the university and look forward to many more of such times. He's gracious to come, kind to come, and always has refreshing word from heaven for us. I do pray for this place. I've prayed for it for a long, long time. I pray for it because I believe God is doing something here that's very special, and I believe you have a pastor who walks in close fellowship with the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe, to be upon him. It's in evidence when you talk to him. Hold his hands up. This is a spiritual warfare. You understand that. Would you please open your Bibles tonight to Matthew 4. Thank you, Pastor, for letting us come. My wife and I can't remember a weekend we've felt more welcome and enjoyed ourselves any more than we have in these hours here. We say that from the bottom of our heart. Come with me in your mind's eye, if you will, to a little remote fishing village on the north shore of the Lake of Galilee. Perhaps in some of those homes, there are mothers with infants in their arms sitting in their rocking chairs, taking a little breather from their arduous domestic labors while their younger children pay, are playing a skip bow or, or jacks or whatever, and maybe waiting for her younger son to come back from the synagogue school with his backpack on and Maybe some of the fishermen who have toiled all night on the sea have come home really tired to get a little sleep. Uh, shop owners are selling their wares and older men are gathered at a tea shop having some tea and some pastries, Krispy Kreme donuts or whatever they ate at that time. And uh, life is just normal for them until all of a sudden, in the streets, there is a stirring, there is noise, they are hearing a voice that is very loud, they're trying to discern what it is saying, and they come to the windows and they see a stranger. And he's walking through their town, shouting at the top of his lungs, repent! The kingdom of God is at hand. What would you think if somebody came to your town, walked down the streets of your neighborhood, shouting something that didn't even make much sense to you? You might call the police. You might shutter and the windows and lock your doors. You, is this some crazy person? Who is this? I would imagine that when the event we're going to read about here in this passage took place, that's exactly what some of them did. Follow as I begin reading in verse 13 of chapter 4. The setting is this. The Lord began his public ministry with the baptism uh, in the Jordan, with John the Baptist doing the baptizing. Then he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights where he communed with the Father, praying and fasting. Then Satan met him at the end of that and tried to tempt him. 
Then he was, admit, he was ministered to by the angels who came and I suppose cooked food and prepared water for him and comforted him after the experience. And then the Bible says he returned to Galilee, went to his hometown of Nazareth. In verse 13, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun in Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These words constitute an invasion. The invasion of a king announcing his kingdom. The overthrow of another kingdom had begun. It began without banners and bullets and cannons and parades and news conferences, without the clacking hooves of prancing horses on the streets. In fact, the Lord Jesus said later in his ministry as recorded in, Acts, in uh, Luke 17, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. Some wise men had come at the time of his incarnation and inquired where this king of the Jews was going to be born. They understood it somehow and had come all the way from Iran to see it. John the Baptist, as he was baptizing in the wilderness, said the kingdom of God is at hand. But the first public declaration of the king himself came on the streets of Capernaum in an obscure place. It came not with observation. It wasn't news headlines. It was overlooked by most people. And the next thing he did was to go throughout all Galilee, verse 23, preaching and teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. This began his three and a half years of preaching the gospel of the kingdom. There are two parts of the kingdom of God. There is the eternal coming kingdom when the king himself will rule and reign and there is the earthly part of his kingdom which began in this passage of scripture and constituted the entire ministry of Christ and of his disciples. It was all about getting men ready for this kingdom. I'm preaching this message tonight because probably your heart like mine needs a lot of encouragement. The headlines nationally and internationally give me no encouragement I could despair if I spent too much time watching the news. I used to do that until I realized that I was becoming a candidate for the insane asylum. It was driving me crazy. Horrible news, incompetent people, derelict leadership, murder, mayhem, madness, and I could do nothing about it. I could just watch it and fume. And I said, this is not, no way to spend my short life. I have lots of good news right here, and uh, I don't need this other stuff. I don't know what it is that might have you discouraged tonight, but it is impossible for me to think about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, they're interchangeable terms, without getting exhilarated. As I've been preparing to preach this to you, my own heart has become thrilled again with the reality that you and I, if we are redeemed, we are sons and daughters of the king, we are heirs of the kingdom, and we will rule and reign with him as long as God lives, so will we. 
As long as his kingdom is secure, so is ours. No armies will ever invade the streets of heaven. No missiles will ever blow God off of his throne. He's the king, the creator, the eternal God, the coming king. And so in chapters, in verses, uh, chapters 5 through 7 of, of Matthew, the Lord immediately took his disciples up unto a mountain. And he began telling them about this kingdom. And I think it would behoove us to know some things that he told about this kingdom. Because we're part of it too. It's as meaningful for us to read these things as it was for them to hear them. For the next three and a half years, they were going to be instructed in what it is to be a part of this eternal kingdom. This kingdom that at this time and continuing to the present is the kingdom of grace. And we're part of it. And it's exciting. He took them up onto this mountain. After announcing that he was the king, after calling these fishermen and a couple of others to come and be part of uh, his little band of disciples, he took them to the mountain and said, I want you to learn something. I want you to learn that the king has expectations that his commandments or his rules are to be kept. Look at verses, look at verse 19. Oh, verse 18, verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle in no wise shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments or rules of the kingdom and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Are you teaching the Bible? Are you going to be teaching the Bible this week? As many of you will, I understand hundreds of you will in various venues across this city. If you're teaching God's commandments, God's word, you are great in the kingdom of heaven. That should keep you faithful. That should give you joy. That should lift your heart. You're great in the kingdom of heaven. Did you ever wonder why the Lord called John the Baptist the greatest who ever lived among men? I've pondered that a lot. There are lots of different opinions about it. I don't guess we can say for sure, but I think my opinion is probably right. If the Lord said, whosoever shall teach my word... He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I think that John was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven among men because he was the first of men who ever got to declare the kingdom of God is at hand. That's what he preached out in the wilderness by the river when he was baptizing. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 3. I think he was the greatest among the great, we are great if we give his word. But John got to do it first. What a privilege that must have been for him. They learned that God had a word that was meant to be kept and that there were penalties and, uh, for those who did not keep his word. In verses 10 through 12, they learned that citizens of this kingdom would be mistreated for his sake by the earthly kingdom and its king, Satan, and that they would receive eternal reward for their mistreatment. Look at verses 10 and following. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. What else did he teach them about his kingdom? They learned that the prince of darkness, the enemy of their king, Jesus, would place counterfeit citizens in the kingdom of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 13. Verse 24, another parable. 
put he forth unto them, saying, Matthew 13, 24, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his fields. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares or weeds among them, among the wheat, and he went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? That is the wheat, I mean the, the tares. And he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the harvest time, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And if you'll turn over just a few verses here, he explains this further. He said unto them, verse 37, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good, this good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The devil specializes in sowing look-alike wheat among the wheat. Every church has tares in it, weeds, they belong to another kingdom and they sit in disguise among those who are citizens by saving grace of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord Jesus had a little group of 12. One of them was the devil. One was a weed, if you will. One in 12. Should we think that our ratio is any more successful than his? One in 12, a devil. If we were to count, I don't know if we should start over here. One, two, three, four, or over here. Problem is, we can't know because the wheat and the tares growing together look alike. And many there will be, according to Matthew 7, many there will be in that day of judgment who will say, Lord, Lord, we did wonderful things in thy name. We cast out devils. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. In this congregation, there will be some like that. These were people who were doing wonderful things for him, but they were not of his. That's the way the kingdom of heaven is in the present form. It's a mixture of true citizens and imposters. They learned that riches were so profoundly compelling to the kingdom of the world and are a major impediment to those who are entering the kingdom of God. You remember in Matthew 19, don't take the time to read it, the Lord said it's hard for a rich man to enter in to heaven he can only go with great difficulty why is that he has another God his riches he's trusting in himself his sufficiency his production of life and he's very self-sufficient and satisfied and to hear that he needs the saving grace of Christ is an insulting thing to him because it's reflecting upon his ingenuity and his skills and the Lord said no to the rich young ruler. You go and get rid of everything you have and then you'll be able to come to me. I don't know what it is that may be keeping somebody here tonight outside of Christ from coming to Christ. But whatever it is, my friend, it will not be worth it when you're in hell to have held on to that. 
believing that somehow your works, your own abilities could attain you favor with God. They learned that none who give their lives for the sake of the kingdom of God will be sorry that they did so. Turn over to uh, Luke chapter 18. All of his ministry with his disciples was teaching them what the kingdom of God was, what it looked like, how his citizens conducted themselves. Luke 18, 28. Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that has left house, parents, brethren, wife, children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who will not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. He was teaching his disciples, No one who gives his life for the sake of the kingdom of God will be sorry that they did so. Everything the Lord did with these disciples was about his kingdom, getting them ready to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to advance the kingdom, to give the word of the kingdom. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. The devil's always at work. Every time you give out a gospel tract, every time you have a Bible study, every time you speak to your neighbor or your friend or a stranger of Christ, you're giving the word of the kingdom, the scripture. And every time that's happening, the devil or his demons are always there, snatching away the word of the kingdom before it gets into the heart. I came across this somewhere. Let me read it to you. Imagine, if you will, that you work for a company whose president found it necessary to travel out of the country and spend an extended period of time abroad. So he says to you and to the other trusted employees, look, I'm going to leave, and while I'm gone, I want you to pay close attention to this business. You manage things while I'm away. I will write you regularly, and when I do, I will instruct you in what you should do from now until I return from this trip. And everyone agrees. He leaves and stays gone for a couple of years. During that time, he writes often, communicating his desires and concerns. When he returns, he walks up to the front door of the company and discovers everything is in a mess. Weeds flourishing in the flower beds, windows broken across the front of the building, the girl at the front desk dozing and doing her nails, loud music roaring from the several offices, two or three people engaged in horseplay in the back room. Instead of making a profit, the business has suffered a great loss. Without hesitation, he calls everyone together and asks, what happened? Didn't you get my letters? You say, oh, yeah, sure. We got all your letters. We even bound them in a book. Some of us have memorized them. In fact, we have letter study every Sunday. You know, those were really great letters. I think the president would then ask, but what did you do about my instructions? And no doubt the employees would respond, do? Well, nothing. We read every one of them. There is the word of the kingdom. God expects us to do more than read it. He expects us to do it, to propagate it, to spread it abroad, to sow the seed, to preach the gospel of the kingdom. As Jesus did. Look at Matthew chapter 10. He sent out his disciples on their first preaching endeavor. He said in verse 6, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was their message. They never stopped doing that until... The Lord took them home. 
The gospel of the kingdom, my friends, is the gospel of light. And when it advances, it brightens the darkness of the kingdom of darkness. The world around us is a kingdom of darkness. It has a prince, the prince of the power of the air, even Satan. I don't need to tell you. You can give me your own horrifying examples of how dark the darkness is today. Our kingdom is a kingdom of light. It permeates the darkness. It lightens the darkness. As the light advances, the darkness retreats. As the light retreats, the darkness advances. And that's pretty much where we are today. Mission enterprise is retreating. Timid Christians are retreating. We're hiding the light under the bushel. And the darkness is very dark. All men in this world remain in the kingdom of darkness until they enter the kingdom of light by repentance. Christ's first message that we read here in Capernaum in chapter 4, repent. Repent was the disciples' first message, Matthew 10. Repent was the apostles' first private invitation to sinners in Acts 2. And it was their first public invitation on the streets of Jerusalem in Acts 3. As I see the scripture, the door to the kingdom of heaven swings on the hinges of repentance. We can't enter the kingdom of light while we remain as citizens of the kingdom of darkness. We have to pass from the darkness to the light. There is no commonality between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And we who are in the kingdom of light by the grace of Christ, we live in the midst of the kingdom of darkness and we let our light shine and we proclaim that Christ will save all who will come by him to the Father. came across this in a book by David Wells recently. Since born again, believers live no differently at an ethical level than plain secularists do. Clearly in the churches from which these born againers come, there is a dismal ignorance about the Bible, about its central vision of the greatness of God's holiness, and about the consequent need for our own authenticity before him. In the evangelical world, it is almost as if the prodigal, who had once returned from his father's waiting arms, has become beset by lingering doubts. Does he have to be so far from those pigsties? Is everything bad in the far-off country? Are the riotous parties entirely off limits? Why can't he just be in touch with the world he left behind? If he remains in his place at home, can't he also become all things to all men and identify with the far off country? Would not that secure for him more friends? How will they hear the story of having been welcomed back if he refuses to go to their parties? No, what fellowship has light with darkness? It has none. We're two entirely different kingdoms. And our job is to proclaim the saving message to those in the kingdom of darkness that they don't have to remain there. We have been delivered from the power of darkness, Colossians tells us. And we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Why then 
do we love the kingdom of darkness so much? We love those in the darkness because they need to get in the kingdom where we are the same way we got there. But we don't love the darkness. It's not our world anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, as we bring this message to a close, you and I tonight have the great privilege of anticipating with immense joy. We have the ability to vibrate with excitement over our coming eternal kingdom and we're told to pray for it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That's a prayer. It should be the prayer expressing the desire of our heart. Lord, if your kingdom eternal would come, Lord, we'd be so happy if it would just come today. I like the kingdom of grace, Lord, but I sure do look forward to your eternal kingdom where we by your grace will be for all of eternity. Are you anticipating the coming eternal kingdom? Do you pray thy kingdom come? How, how long has it been? Maybe since many in this room have prayed, Lord, thy kingdom come. How many of us seek it as of chief importance? Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek it first. Let it dominate your daily objectives for living. That men might be born into that kingdom. That that kingdom might flourish. That that light might go into the darkness in a greater way to destroy whatever power and hold the kingdom of darkness is having over people. The kingdom of God is a gift that waits for us. Christmas is coming. You already have decorations up at the college and magnificent ones at that. We saw them today. Something better than Christmas is coming. Amen. The eternal kingdom of God is coming. And he said, I want you to pray for it. And I want you to seek it more than anything else. Seek it first. And then he tells you, while you're waiting for it, be still. And know that I'm God. Be patient. It will come at just the right time. God's not in a hurry. He'll not miss any of his deadlines. When he's ready, the king will come. Be quiet in the meantime. Be unperturbed by what's happening in the kingdom of darkness. Be patient. Be restful. Matthew chapter 25, he told his disciples to be watchful. And my dear friends, in the face of the grandeur of the privilege of being in the kingdom of God, the eternal creator, God, who holds all the universe in perpetual balance in the palm of his hand, who spoke the worlds into existence, who keeps the solar system going. Who put this earth in the Milky Way galaxy. That's a flash of stars across the sky at night. It's, it's our galaxy. We're in that thing, you know. Seems so far off, doesn't it? It's part of our galaxy. I mean, we're part of that galaxy. This little piece of earth that's 8,000 miles in diameter. This little tiny earth. 8,000 miles in diameter. Our nearest star is the sun and it's 92 million miles away. And the scientists have told us that if you hollow out the center of the sun, you could put 1.3 million earths in the center of the sun. And this is just one little tiny corner of God's great universe. Amen. Right. They're estimating now probably... 200 billion suns in the universe. My friends, 
Let's not trivialize God. Let's not bring him down and try to put him in little boxes that we create. Let's let God be God because he will be anyhow. <laughs> and let's rejoice that he is God and that he cares about this little tiny specks of dirt like us. And he says, you are better than the sparrows. In a way, that's not much of a compliment at all. If he had said you were better than rubies or diamonds or gold, we might say, well, yeah, we're pretty good because that's pretty good. And that's worth a lot. And he says, you're better than sparrows. And those little lilies that he look, makes look so nice and we enjoy the beauty of so much, you're better than them and you're better than the grass, the pasture grass that gets cut down and put in the fire. You're better than the grass. I'm glad God treasures the citizens of his kingdom and says, I can sure take care of you because you're better than a lot of other little tiny things that I take real good care of. Let's not reduce the kingdom of God to ritual and ceremony and trivial stuff. We sit around and chew the theological rags. We sit around and discuss in our vain imaginations concepts that we think we have figured out and that we are so much more knowledgeable than our brothers and sisters that we're sitting around talking about these things. Let's realize that we're to be pitied if we demean the kingdom of God and his meaning. This is a great concept, folks. The kingdom of God has come to the kingdom of darkness and before he ever announced that he was the king and his kingdom was now, at the end of his temptation, Satan came to him and showed him the kingdoms of this world and all of that vanity that goes with it, the popularity, the fame, the acclaim, the wealth, the power, and he said, if you'll worship me, Jesus, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. The Lord must have just, I don't know what he did. This must have been the most ludicrous appeal. The king of the kingdom of heaven being attracted by the kingdoms of this world? An utterly absurd idea on Satan's part. But I'm afraid the kingdoms of this world are not utterly absurd ideas to us. But I think many of us lust after those things and all of the favor and the wealth and the prominence that it gives to us. And I'm afraid a lot of young people in the kingdom of God look upon the celebrities who are in the kingdom of this world, their luminaries, and say, I'd like to have that power, and I'd like to have that fame, and I'd like to have that attention. You just don't get the greatness of the kingdom of God. There's nothing to compare to it. And one of these days, the kingdom of grace is going to come to a close. And Revelation eleven fifteen says, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. I pray that God will send us out with rejoicing in our hearts tonight at the favor and goodness that God has bestowed upon us. Re redeeming our souls and making us joint heirs with Jesus Christ in his kingdom. God bless you.